Go for it, Rick. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the why people buy or don't buy because don't we all wonder sometimes about this? If you're in business, if you're selling something, some kind of goods or services. <laughs> and sometimes it seems really obvious, like when people buy, it's like they're really in need of your item when you speak to them for the very first time ever. But that doesn't happen all that often. So today we're going to talk uh, about the psychology of sales or why people buy. And I'm Jen Phillips April, Right Words Marketing here in the Dreammaker Studio. And with me is Rick Toon of <laughs> Shoot Better Video. Many of you are, are familiar with Rick. Uh, so Rick, let's talk about, we were talking a little bit before about cars because that's an easy analogy, right? Everyone has ridden in a car. You've probably bought a car, maybe multiple cars in your life. So let's talk about cars like what makes you buy a car a particular kind of car so rick has done a lot of car commercials in his past he was a former um, uh, art director in hollywood so did a lot of commercials so rick talk to us about cars and why people buy cars so cars everybody cars are a big part of american life car makers know that there are a lot of car makers you can probably name 10 without really thinking about it, it used to be there were like the big three and now there's like everybody else so and many more and, and they're all good, right? So what's the difference between a Volkswagen and a Mercedes? The, you know, they're both German engineered. They both get you from point A to point B. One costs significantly more than others at, at times, and you, although you get cheap Mercedes. But the bottom line is, your, if your goal is to get from point A to point B, a car works. Okay, so what they're all selling is the same product. Right. In essence. Hi, Susie. Joined us. You know, they've got a steering wheel, they've got four wheels, they've got a transmission, they've got an engine, you know, and it, it, in today's world, it doesn't matter. Is it electric, is it gas, is it diesel? It's still the same basic product, yet it's a very different product. So but, much goes into it, right? So much goes into it. So here, but here's the reality. I mean, some people really care about what they're driving or riding in, and others don't care so much. Yeah, so the car dealers have to, the manufacturers have to understand uh, the number is 6% of American population at any one time is looking or thinking about a new car. So, 6%, but, huh? 6%. Okay. But where does that fall? How does that fall? What does that mean? We were looking for a car, and we went to a dealer, and we, we looked at cars, we test drove a couple of cars. It wasn't quite right. The dealer vibe wasn't right. And then all of a sudden one appeared on Facebook in a, in a group we belonged to, and Jim picked up the phone, called, went and met the guy, bought the car. That day, yep. But for six months, she had been sort of in that car thinking mode. Well, a couple of months go by, and then all of a sudden, like, uh, my kids are coming home from college and getting driver's license, and so now we've got a car and three drivers in the family. How does that work? So now we're in a different car mode. Ended up, you know, we switched some things around. We ended up getting cars. Everybody's got cars now. So again, we're back in that car buying. So cars, do they, they revolve through your life, and you don't keep them for a long time, so you're always. But 6% of the population doesn't sound like a very big number, but when you've got uh, 330 million or how many Americans there are, 6% of that is a lot of people right. looking at cars. So, A, there's a market. Just like restaurants, everybody has to eat. However... Sometimes you want a convertible, sometimes you want an automatic, sometimes you want a this, you live in the snow, you live in the sun, you live, I mean, there's all these different... Lots of factors that go into it. Right, and your comfort level, oh, and your pricing. But well, how does any of that affect the psychology of buying? The psychology of buying is the dealer, the car manufacturer in this case, has to understand all that matters to you. We live in the Northeast. We don't see a lot of commercials for convertibles. If you live in the Southwest, you see a lot more commercials for convertibles. Mm, okay. If you live in Florida, you see convertibles, right? Right. Makes sense. Because it makes sense to have. In the Northeast, it doesn't make sense to have a convertible as much. You know? So you really have... So those are targeted markets because the psychology of the buyer is different. And that's a very simple explanation. But every business has that. Just like everybody with a mouth is not your customer if you own a restaurant. Right. 
you know? You have to get really specific. And I was thinking of this, uh, I told you last night, I think it was, that, uh, you know, if you're buying a car for your teenager who just got a uh, driver's license and you want them to have a safe, reliable, second-hand car, and my answer is we gave my old car to one of Rick's children. So that, that was, it was still a reliable car, 10 years old, had a lot of, you know, fair amount of mileage on it. And, but it's, it's reliable, it's sturdy, so get the kid to where he needs to go. He's yeah. in college. How much does he need to go? Exactly. But that's a different place in your mind than, you know, if we're buying something completely new. Like, I didn't want, you know, a 15-year-old Saturn. You know, I was done with the Saturn. I wanted to move on to something that was a little bit nicer, a little newer. So, that, it didn't have to be brand new. And I was being, you know, and I was conscious, but it, did, it had to be middle of the road. And then I was thinking of, like, you know, it matters if you want to be turning the heads on the street. Like, so, right? Because we bought a Honda Accord, which is a very, you know kind of a plain Jane um, automobile, which will get you from point A to point B, safe, reliable, what have you. That was fine, it was, it was in good condition, good priced, everything was fine there. But we were not in the market for Maserati. We did a totally different kind of a car and mindset. <laughs> you might have wanted the Maserati, but not this week. <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, so you're thinking about that, apply that to your own business and customer base. I talked about this too a few days ago in the, um, in the uh, video about moving. You know, you really are getting specific. So like when you're car shopping, you start getting specific about whether you want the mileage works for you matters. Um, how, how are you going to be using the car? Where do you live? Do you need a big SUV so you can cart a lot of stuff around? Or do you want like a little Prius so you have to buy gas once every three months? I mean, you know, what's your lifestyle? Like that, all that plays a role in what kind of car you get or what you're looking for. So it's the same thing for your customers. So your clients are looking for a specific thing. They're looking for a specific solution to a problem. So when you're providing that solution to their problem and it's a match made that just lines up perfectly, then everyone's happy. Right, and that's the ultimate thing is what, what people are buying is a solution to something, to a, 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 an issue, a problem, a need, a want. I mean, they're, they're, whatever that is, you know, we all know the people that buy lots of shoes, for example, right? There's a need for that. There are a couple of people on this, uh, in the group who do yeah, buy a lot of shoes. Those may, not, may or may not be a solution, but they could be a solution for because you're going to just a wedding. Or... You have a special night out, so you need a different type of shoe than if you're going to go running. Those, you know, those are different types of things. So whatever it is that you're trying to get people to purchase, you need to understand what's their motivation for needing that object or that service or that product right. that you have and not oh I got this great looking thing you should get what I have right you know jewelry is a, one of those hard things it's like why do you buy jewelry do you really need another no I just kind of want it or it's going to serve a purpose but you can't just say oh it's pretty I'll buy it we well, can well, you certainly can <laughs> but how many pretty things do you need and how many do you end up with and then what do you do with them and what's the value that you place on that because that's that's far less of a value than the need for say the car for the college kid who's coming home who's got two different jobs this summer who's got to go from here to here to here five days seven days a week which is what he ended up doing he needed something that he could drive that could get him to these places mm -hmm. And with, you know, he's not making a ton of money, he's in college, so you don't want to go buy a new car, you know. So what our need was, we had the car checked out by a mechanic, he said, you know, is this car sturdy, safe enough, mechanically sound enough, that it's not going to cost him any money for the next couple of years. And it turns out it was, so he gets that car. Right. We could have gone and leased a new car for $189 or something like that, which, again, is an affordable price at the end of the year for a safe car. But what happens when he wrecks it? Oh, right, he did have a little crash this summer. Yeah. What happens when? What happens when? So you start weighing all these different things because these are all part of the thought process that goes into any purchase. Right. And as you, the creator of said product, service, service, whatever it mm -hmm. is, you know, what are people really thinking about, about your product? And people buy on emotion. They buy on two things, really, emotion and logic. We, we have that moment where we're going, oh my gosh, I want that. And then we have that other part, which is that logical part of trying, of going, okay, but do I need this now? What problem does this really solve? What are all the different components of how, you know, the, the, the actual nitty gritty of does it have enough, um, does it meet our needs? 
the, the logical part of it, the rational brain that goes into that. What about the emotions that go into a purchase, Susie asked. So that's like, so when you're writing sales copy, you're really trying to hit those emotions because people buy first on emotion, then they back it up with logic. So, and then that emotion, <laughs> yeah, so we said we're on the same wavelength. That's, that, that's just human psychology. And you can look at, you can read a million books on, on psychology of buying, on sales, of copywriting over the past hundred years, and you're going to see the same thing. I think Mark Twain, I think it was Mark Twain, who had a quote that said, people buy the, the two, two reasons um, a man needs uh, to know something. He's like, the reason he, two reasons for buying something, he, the reason he gives himself and the reason he tells his wife. It's one of those, you know, kind of old man jokes. But when you think about because the guy is buying first on emotion, now he's got to rationalize it to the other party in the household. So, right. you know, we're first buying on emotion. But if you look at all advertising, it's, it's all emotion-based. I mean, every ad you see has been thought about. What, how, what's the hook? What's the emotion? How do we get them interested in, in the product? Why is that? You know, And the emotion can be uh, purely selfish sometimes. How does it solve the problem for me? Or the emotion can be, what are others going to think of me? What is this mm -hmm. about? Right. You know, how, many, how many car commercials do we see where the neighbor got the new car? Now you've got to get the new car, right? What does that say? Oh, wait a second, I gotta keep up with them. So there's different reasons. Right, and tapping into what is going on in the in the mindset of your potential client, your prospect, that is where it comes in to really being key. That's where it comes into your being able to put the words to the paper or the words to the screen that match up with your buyer and with what you offer and what your buyer wants at that time. So maybe they want greater expansiveness, they want greater fulfillment. I know we have a lot of coaches in the group and, and, um, and energy workers, so, you know, people in that world who buy services and products that fit in that world are going to want things like more freedom, more fulfillment, um, or maybe a spiritual alignment. Things like that are going to talk to them, speak to them in a different way than you know, thinking of selling a uh, software product to someone where you're telling them how many gigabytes something holds. I mean, you know, that's a totally different market. Right, and this week, it may be different than next week for that person. Two weeks ago, we didn't know we were moving. Right. This week, we are 100% <laughs> involved in moving. Exactly. We're looking at getting rid of stuff. We're th we looked at the house again yesterday, and we've got to get a few new things. So three weeks ago, we weren't in the market for a couch. Right. Guess what? The couch we have doesn't work there. We gotta get rid of that one and get something new. So now suddenly we're in that market. So if your service may not be needed this week, it may be needed next week. And the point of this is consistency in marketing over and over and over because you never know who's gonna find you at the moment that they actually need something. Exactly. Some percentage of your buyers at any time are people who just came into your circle and saw something you posted or something you wrote someplace and they immediately connected to that and realized that was their solution. For most of your buyers, it's not that case. For most of them, they're hanging out in your sphere. They're watching what you're doing. They're paying a little bit of attention. Maybe they're paying a lot of attention. It varies degrees, depends on where they are in their minds and what else is going on in their lives. But so mo you can have a, it's what we call the buying cycle. And it could take two years, it could take six months, it could take a day and a half, it could take an hour. You know, it really depends on where your client, your prospect finds you, what's going on in their minds, and how well they resonate with you at that moment. And how great their need is, the importance of their need at that moment. Right. You know, that, back to the car thing, that's why 6%, they, don't, they use the number 6%. Because people are thinking about it, they're not really sure, they're wondering. It's really a much smaller percentage of people that are active buyers within that time frame. Because an active buyer is someone who's actually looking at the paper specifically for the ads. The other mm -hmm. people are just kind of, they're getting information along the way. And, you know, when we were looking for the car last year, it was, oh, look, there's one for, we could lease that one. Yeah, but I don't want to lease. I'm going to own it for the next 10 years. I don't want to lease a car. Well, that those are all choices, but it forces you to start thinking about what is your buying decision going to ultimately be. Right. And so it kind of hit, and, you know, e everything is different. And it just turns out this car turned up in a group for sale, it wasn't a lease, it was a private person, mm -hmm. and it, it was like perfect timing. Yes, yes, when I, saw the, when I saw the guy posted this ad with the car and all the amenities of it and the pictures, I was like, that's the car and he's half an hour away and it was, 
it was just perfect. You right. know, it was it had everything I needed. It was um, you know second hand, but it, he was the first owner. I mean, it just had everything I needed. So I've been passively car shopping for about a year. We've been having conversations about it. I've been thinking of it over, looking. So 